Hello, in today's video, we're gonna address the topic, should you log your land? And the short answer, even though I want you to watch the video, would be yes. Um, before logging your land, you know, it's a tough decision. And one of the things I did before logging mine is watch a lot of the different YouTube videos out there with the different resources and, you know, kind of put your mind at ease. There's, there's a lot of information on this topic. That's what I did. And I encourage you to do the same. Now, I am 100% satisfied with the fact that we logged our land and we logged it fairly aggressively. I'll show you how much it's regenerated in the past uh, four years. And, you know, some other things to think about is you can manipulate your land the way you want to. I've had friends log their properties and then change things, add trails, um, do the things they want to for their vision for the future. So thank you for watching today's video and I hope you enjoy it. So what I'm doing right now is I am actually in the middle of making the video for logging your land and have a whole bunch of tips that I wanted to share with you. And I'm out on a section of uh, woods that is now leased by two of my good buddies. And I just wanted to show you a property that I feel was logged the right way and then go over some of the different things um, that I want to touch on this video. So I'm filming this at the end, but I'm going to show it to you towards the beginning. And um, one of the tips is I want you to have a plan for after logging is done. So where do you want the trails? Um, what do you want to do for food plots? How do you want your property to look? Because you have this opportunity to manipulate and change your property. Um, wait and learn. So what I mean by that is, is you don't need to log your property immediately after purchasing it. Um, and again, I know I say that the answer is yes for logging, but it might not be. But wait and learn and uh, just feel out where you want to go for access, where you want to have tree stands and, and different aspects like that. Another thing you want to do is pay attention and have some comparison properties in your back pocket for when you meet with the logger and or the forester. So you can say, hey, when, I, when this is all done, this is what I want it to look like. Make sure that you meet with different foresters and loggers. Your county will give you a list of forest or uh, loggers and the logger may have a forester that they use to mark the trees. They'll allow you to walk the property with them. And you can hire a forester to take you all the way through the process and make sure that you're getting the amount of uh, revenue you, sh you should be getting or um, you can do it on your own. You do pay for that service though. So I elected to not do that. Um, define your objectives with the logger and make those clear, meaning, hey, I'm a deer hunter. This is what I want the property to look like when I'm finished. This is not timber sand improvement. Um, they're gonna want to take care of your property for logging for the future. And you gotta kind of find a happy medium there because they're gonna be fighting their natural instincts, especially if they're not deer hunters themselves. And do not assume that they are because a lot of loggers just don't have time to deer hunt too. Another thing you wanna make sure that you take advantage of it would be to make sure the forester is aware and loggers are aware of the trees that you wanna keep. Um, when they're out marking trees, you have the opportunity to go over that with them. And you're not a pest if you go along with them or check up on them and ask them like, hey, you know, this tree's split, why didn't you take it? Or could you please take it? Or, you know, if you wanna leave a clump of trees by a tree stand, you know, you can tell them to do so. And they will mark trees different ways. Sometimes they mark them to cut and sometimes they mark them to keep. And you have to remember they're working for you and you have to advocate for yourself. And obviously along with that, you need to be respectful in how you do that to maintain that relationship all the way through the process. Hopefully you can define a time frame for when it's best for you to log. You're gonna be at their mercy and their schedule somewhat. Um, in northern climates, like where we live, we have to worry about oak wilt. And with worrying about oak wilt, um, logging in the winter is best. And if you have a way to entice the logger to do your property when you want it, um, that might be a bargaining chip. Like for us, we had a, a big chunk of acreage and that allowed me some flexibility on when the logger would come in. And so he kind of worked with me on when I wanted to do it. 
All right, the last couple points I want to make, I'm up, up on this gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful ridge, is a hunting woods isn't necessarily a pretty woods. And I picked this property in particular because this was logged the right way. It's pretty thick, but it's due to be logged again. And you want to get even more of the floor exposed. But just keep that in mind that it's not going to necessarily look that pretty to start with. It's going to thicken up. And that's why I actually agree with being in managed forest crop because, you know, you dedicate yourself to logging every so often and it doesn't take long for things to thicken up and for you to want to reestablish your trails. So this is a managed forest crop property that was logged aggressively and is ready to go again. And then just remember, I think I've touched on this a few times, you don't have to log everything with the same intensity. I picked some sections and logged them very aggressively and then some sections not as aggressively. So that's up to you, um, you're the landowner. So hope these tips are helpful and I hope you enjoy the rest of this video. So I'm gonna start this video here at what we call the Oak Island. Uh, it's an oak peninsula and it was a mix of oaks, red oaks, white oaks, and then popples. And this would be medium in terms of how intense it was logged on this property. I asked the loggers to take every popple and basswood out that didn't have a stand in it, no stands and popples, but quite a few stands and basswoods and the regeneration is phenomenal. So um, you can't see very far in and you can see up to that knob and um, just a, a beautiful bedding area for all the deer. And I would anticipate this being the spot where if I was a buck, this is where I would be. There is a view back towards where we had our first clip at the Oak Island. And we're transitioning into the section that was hit the hardest by a storm we had. Um, what I had is I had owned this property for about four years, had hunted it, knew that we needed to log it, and was waiting, waiting to figure out where we, how we we're gonna hunt it, where we wanted the stands. And then unfortunately had a couple bad storms. So it was time, this was a mature closed canopy and it needed to be logged. And uh, it wasn't about the revenue, it was about thickening it up and making it hold more deer. And the first winter we logged it, we, went, we logged it in the winter, which I believe is the best time, especially with oaks. And it held tons of deer, you know, for the browse from the tops. And one hint that I'll give you with logging is, you know, you want to compare what you want to other sections that have been logged. So yeah, tell the loggers, you know, that I want it to look like this when you're done in terms of how thick to log it. Loggers will give you the opportunity to tell you, tell them what trees you want cut and what you want kept. And you definitely want to work with the logger and the forester on that. Um, I had a forester come out, walk me through everything. You can hire a forester to walk you through the whole process. I didn't do that. I just kind of went with my gut on who we had hired. And so you can see how this has thickened up and then how we left most of the good trees. And I told them to leave every viable white oak because the white oak produces a better acorn. So um, if you look close, you can see the trail going up to one of our bank splines. Next, I'm gonna take you over here um, to the back of the frame. I have a trail that I put through after we logged and I'm gonna show you the difference between aggressive logging like this and then um, logging for timber stand improvement or TSI. We are in the woods right now. I just showed you that trail that came out towards the bank spline up there. And the, the field that we were just on is literally only 50 yards to the outside of the frame. And I just wanted to show you how thick this is. Now, deer perspective down here, there's no way you can see through this. And it did take a couple years to fill in. And then if we go over here, you can see in the background where I'm gonna take you next. And that is the property that was not logged as aggressively and didn't let as much light in. So you can see the thick brush here and then you can see how open it is in the background. And then I'm gonna take you or look back this direction to give you another perspective as well. 
One thing I will say though, um, about the people that I have logged this, the company I log it, they left a lot of litter. And I mean, I guess that serves a purpose for uh, preventing deer from getting to certain places, but I'm gonna use a cringeworthy when I saw how much debris was left behind. And I don't know, I'm on the fence whether that was good or not. And the next time I log, I'm gonna actually use the company that logged this neighboring chunk because they just did a better job of cleaning up the tops. And I just feel like that's better overall for regen or maybe a mix of both, or maybe just completely leaving some tops, but not crushing them as you come through with the different equipment, the forwarder and the logging machines themselves. So um, I'm gonna take you over here next and take a look back this direction and I'm gonna stand right in the line to show you the difference. Okay, so right here, we're looking into the neighboring property now. Full disclosure, I am absolutely, utterly blessed to now own this. I never ever thought that that was going to be the case. And I wish if I knew that, I would have behaved differently in terms of where I put a trail. Now I would put a trail right on the property line right here if I was never gonna own the neighboring property. I didn't know that. But because this is a transition between how we logged ours and how the neighbors chose to log theirs, deer travel right on the edge and you're, entic you're enticing people, hunters, to want to hunt on the edge even more so than normal. So that was a learning experience and then for access it would have been great to have a trail and then just pop in. You're going to lose woods anyways along your border in terms of huntability. So here's our property, the original property, super super thick. Now I'm standing pretty tall so I'll pan the camera down here so you can see how thick it is. And then we'll pan over to the new property that was logged very well, but with a different purpose in mind. And the gentleman that used to own this property is was a friend of mine and just a great human being. And I miss him dearly. And he just, over the years, logged this with a different purpose. Um, he was a forest steward. And... You can see there's a fallow field in the background that's a hundred yards away you know and this ridge up here is another 130 150 yards away so it'll be fun to sit in here during rifle season um, but it is too open uh, for hunting all the time and now that it's ours i'm going to try and um, make more light come down you know log it uh more aggressively it is a managed forest crop close so there are some rules i have to follow but the rules are pretty um in the landowner's favor in terms of things and you can see how well this has been managed by how straight the red oaks are and um it is a beautiful timber stand i just wanted to take one more clip and pan from uh logging that was done for timber stand over to logging that was done for hunting purposes. So left to right here, so you can see the difference in how many trees were left. And again, this was hit by storm damage and we did this five years after owning the property to get a better feel for deer travel patterns. And of course those deer travel patterns change somewhat after you log, but just to give you an idea of the openness over here versus the thickness of the understory and brush. Um, in the background over here. What we're looking at here is my fence line and I wanna show you how thick I left this and I will hinge some more of these trees. I've hinged them once or twice before and now I'm gonna pan and I apologize, it's a little crunchy for a sec. I'm gonna walk um, this way and show you a neighboring property and this landowner has a different prerogative. They are they burn wood and are the only rifle hunt and so you can see how open this woods is and in my opinion without a doubt this needs to be logged and needs to be logged fairly aggressively but i'm primarily a bow hunter i love rifle hunting for the transitions but um, you can see another property that when you come out here and clean up the wood how open it is and you can see as far as topography lets you see and it's a beautiful woods and lots of hardwood, but at the same time, in my opinion, not that great for hunting. Um, wanted to tell you just some things along the way. I'm trying to cover all my bases during these different video clips. You know, when you log, if you decide to take that leap to log, it's a tough one for sure. And 
I think overall, in the end, after a few years have passed, you will be satisfied. Now, the trick is to pick a good logger and do your homework and then talk to the foresters and get a feel for things before you begin. And if you can, if you're in a northern state, I would suggest logging in um, winter or you know late fall, depending on what your hunting goals are. And um, I couldn't be happier that we did what we did and it's only getting better year by year. So just another property, different perspective. I'm gonna take you a couple more places and then I'll call this a wrap. Now I'm standing on top of what we call the clear cut. And this was almost all popples. And I had, I said, hey, take every popple that we can make money off on out. And I think they took every popple off the whole property, which I was fine with because uh, popples regenerate at an alarming rate. And I don't know, this is about five acres. It's surrounded by fields. Our whole property, we try to treat as a sanctuary so we don't drive around uh, these fields or these chunks of woods. We hunt the edges and I have had bucks come out of this and you know they are cruising for does and I hope the picture does this justice because this is super thick. I'll take another shot right down where those they left those hardwoods for me and they also left some pines which becomes a roosting area for turkeys. It's very fun to watch them go in there and roost but this was the most aggressively logged chunk um, any chunk that had popples, we uh, logged very, very aggressively just because um, we wanted it to thicken up. And this is super, super thick and great cover for the deer. And I did mow a trail uh, with a DR walk behind brush mower through this just to kind of try and steer the deer. That's another thing I like to say, steer the deer. So looking on top of the clear cut right now, I'll take you down to the bottom in just a minute. And I hope you can get an idea of how super, super thick this is. Here's just a great example of how thick popple regeneration is. And so we are at the Oak Island and this was combination of oaks and popples. And these popples are all 15, 20 feet, 15 feet tall. There's a ridge back there. You can barely make it out. Can't see well more than 15 yards into the woods and then I'm gonna pan this way. The field edge is right there. It's 30 yards. In fact, my truck is in the frame right now and there's just no way you can even make it out. So um, this is a trail that I cut every year and maintain with a pull behind mower and you need to use a hedge trimmer this year and get along the sides because um, naturally things are um, wanting to bend in towards the light. That's called phototropism, I believe. So um, what we're doing is um, I'm walking you down this trail that I maintain off my property boundary. Property boundary is about 40 yards that way uh, where those pines are. And I have some great pictures of my little beavers helping me clear this trail for the forestry mulcher. And I don't even know that we would have needed to use a forestry mulcher to be honest. So. Next, I'm just gonna take you up there because I know I have an awesome picture of the kids standing right about there just to give you a perspective of what this looked like after they took all the logs out. And you know, if you do this, you get that pit in your stomach, just know that this is the end result. So at the bottom of the frame, that's where the kids were standing in the picture when we were clearing this, getting ready to log it. And just to give you a perspective of how tall these popples are, um, I would say 20 feet here. Um, and this is five years ago and nice and tight showing you how thick this is. So tell me if you're a deer, you're not going to feel comfortable in this stuff. So I know there's sheds in here. I know I mentioned, uh, being a shed hunter and yet to find one, but it's going to happen. So just another clip of the post logging regeneration. We were just on a four-wheeler pull-behind mower trail, and now we're on a DR walk-behind mower trail that was supposed to be for access. And so we're right along my property boundary. And the idea behind this thinner trail was um, it'd be more for sneaking in and out, but deer use this too. So more of the regeneration that we are on the my southern end of the Oak Island. But the reason I came over here for this clip was 
Um, I know there's some disdain for pines and this is a neighboring property and these are red pines and I grew up with red pines in my yard. I hate them. Um, I know that's a strong word, but they're ugly in my opinion. Now, this property used to be open for us to walk through and even hunt if we wanted to. So I know how thick it is underneath these pines. Now it's closed now and so I haven't been in there in a couple of years, but um, I just want to tell you that you can do pines the right way too. Um, you know, this is Northern Wisconsin and we have mixed hardwoods and pines and all there is, it's mostly pines. But if you log pines and open them up like these people did, they did it the right way. It is thicker than snot as well. So this is a bedding area and it actually makes hunting ours a little bit harder um, because you want to hunt your own property. But when you got a bedding area behind you, it becomes very, very tricky. So pine's done the right way. And I'm sure this is due for another logging. Um, I don't know what purpose red pines that are this thick serve, but maybe pulp. But anyway, <laughs> uh, just another clip of a different neighbor and their logging approach. And I, again, think they did this the right way with their pines. And on our new property, we do have some pines and uh, I'm gonna thin them out for sure. Let more light hit the ground. We're in a different section of woods. I call this the middle woods, um, looking towards the neighbor's pines that I just had you at. This is a four-wheeler mode trail that cuts through, meanders through the property, again, to try and manipulate deer movement. And a couple things came to mind between last clip and this clip. First of all, to set your mind at ease, you log, it gets thick, deer are gonna find their way through it. They're gonna find their natural way through it. So. They've established this trail, Path of Least Resistance, somehow, and it's a established trail. So this middle woods, cleverly named because it's in the middle of our property, it actually goes down to the back 40, and this was primarily hard maple. And another thing you need to do is visit with the logger, the forester, the company, talk about the value of the timber, because hard maple was a money tree, so I said, hey, you know, let's maximize that and take as many out as you needed to. And again, this was just closed canopy, way too open underneath. And it is super thick. I did go through and hinge some trees in the background there to try to thicken it up even more. And to kind of barricade and, and move deer, or try to get them to go um, towards the top edge or bottom where we have stands. Uh, when we logged, White pines were worthless, but they're not to me. They're aesthetically gorgeous. They remind me of as a kid driving down to the family farm in Blair, Wisconsin. And so I love that we have them on our property. I pretty much just think of this as mini Blair. The hills aren't as steep. and <laughs> So far the deer aren't as big either, but um, that's in my uh, working future, hopefully. So white pines are all left and I love it. You know, turkey roosting area and then hard maples logged fairly aggressively and the goal is to thicken this up so you can't make out that hidden field in the back of the frame um, the hidden field is just a little island field surrounded by woods it's a dynamite honey hole spot this will be the last clip on our logging tour series we're at the bottom of the clear cut and i showed you those white pines from the top and showed you those oaks that they left me from the top and you can kind of make out a couple ridges and valleys in here and then in the back of the frame right now is our hexagon permanent stand um just want to remind you again that you can pick how heavy you log different sections it's your land and the loggers will work with you they'll work with you on which trees you want to keep and why but i would definitely go through that before they start logging especially if you have spots you want to leave for tree stands so um, just a different view of where I already took you today. And I'm also going to pan, since we're, I have you here, um, I'm going to pan down to the creek bottoms and you can, you can make out a few of the majestic bur oaks. They didn't log the creek bottoms. I didn't want them to log the creek bottoms. I wanted these trees, uh, to be there forever. They probably have zero timber value. You know, they're, I'd call them heirloom trees, probably over hundred years old, um, easily but at the same time, just another different um, diversity in terms of the, the land. So last thing I'll say, share is that I am in a conservation stewardship program and I'll be planting some swamp oaks down here. I, I do love trees. Everybody knows that about me and I can't wait till this spring to 
uh, change this up from what used to be pasture into something else. Thank you for watching today's episode on logging your property. I hope you found it informative and entertaining. Thank you uh, for supporting this channel and helping it grow. As always, I appreciate your viewership and I thank you for making it a great day to be outdoors.